Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 7 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. Myself Dr. Abhishek Kumar. In earlier discussions, we have discussed about the occurrence of earthquake which is primarily related to movement of the plates, convection current generated in deeper layers of the earth. Now, whenever earthquake happens at the source, there will be material involved primarily the material which is available on fault plane, whenever because of strain energy accumulation and the stresses which are developing exceeding the in situ shear strength, the material will undergo failure. Whenever we are talking about failure, sometime it will be melting, sometime it will be rupture. As a result, disturbance, some sort of disturbance will be created at the source or at the focus of the earthquake. And this disturbance or the energy which has been now released at the focus will start propagating in all the direction with respect to the epicenter, uh, with respect to the focus. So, if this is the focus, then in all the direction with respect to the focus in three dimensional space, if we see the energy will be propagating in all the three dimensions away from your point of origin or the focus from where the seismic energy was actually initiated during a particular earthquake. Now, this energy released from the source and propagating it will happen in terms of seismic waves. So, there will be disturbance which will be created at the source and as the seismic energy is interacting with the medium, you might be remembering this is crystal medium in which the epicenter of the earthquake is located, the focus of the earthquake is located. So, from the epicenter, uh, from the focus of the earthquake the seismic waves will come into picture as the disturbance or seismic energy is propagating. Now, this movement uh, because of this seismic waves coming into picture, there will be different kinds of movement happening in the propagation medium. So, you see there is a medium involved over here, there is a medium involved over here. This medium will undergo different kind of disturbances even whenever we are hearing and uh, experiencing any kind of earthquake, suppose some earthquake has happened in near epicentral region and we are also standing over there, many a time we will also sense some kind of vibration happening in the ground. So, that vibration can be understood as the response of the system when a particular seismic wave is propagating through a particular medium. Whenever we are discussing about recording stations, so again there is seismic wave which has been generated from the focus propagating in different directions, wherever recording station is coming into picture, recording station will actually sense the amplitude of vibrations with respect to time, which is changing when seismic wave is propagating through your recording station. So, whenever recording station is there, it is the response which is recorded by the recording station. Whenever building is there, same seismic loading will help in uh, uh, response of the particular building. So, if building is designed for that response, the, the building will be able to withstand that particular earthquake loading, otherwise there will be minor cracks, there can be collapse also. So, every time whenever either we are feeling the earthquake or there is recording or building is there, basically it is the response of that particular system related to seismic waves which are actually propagating through that particular system location and primarily at that particular uh, uh, location. Many a times we will uh, 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 install recording station may be in bedrock medium, may be in uh, soil medium, but not at the ground surface, but at deeper depth. So, accordingly the vibrations will keep on modifying itself as these are interacting with the material properties. Further details about seismic waves propagation, how these are interacting with the medium and what are the governing equations which will control the uh, motion properties that we will discuss when we will discuss in details about seismic waves, ground motion and ground response analysis. So, in today's topic that is in lecture number 7, we will be discussing about what are the different kinds of seismic waves and overview, governing equation of these waves, how it is propagating through a particular medium, what is the resistance medium is offering which ensure that the wave is propagating through a particular medium that we will discuss in later lectures. So, in today's lecture, we will be discussing about what are the different kinds of seismic waves. As the name suggests, seismic waves means different kinds of waves 
which come into action which come into existence primarily because of some seismic activity. Now, by virtue of the characteristic that when these waves propagate through a particular medium, some will cause compression air friction, some will cause elliptical motion, some will cause lateral motion, some will cause shearing. Each kind of wave propagation will be responsible for each different kinds of particle motion in the medium. As motion in the particle is happening, the system is going to respond to the earthquake loading condition. And of course, whenever seismic wave we are interested to uh, 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 talk about, we will be also interested to know if there is a way, a mechanism based on which we can locate the epicenter of the earthquake. That means, whenever recording station is there, which is actually sensing the vibration because of a particular earthquake at different different locations. So, certainly whenever record is there, we do not know where actually earthquake has happened. So, we have to analyze the earthquake characteristics based on the ground motion record which is available to us. That is how we will be able to locate the earthquake epicenter and as I mentioned in earlier lectures also, if one is interested to find out the focal mechanism of an earthquake, what was the dominating kind of movement at the source at the fault plane which has triggered during a particular earthquake normal faulting, reverse faulting, strike slip faulting, dip slip faulting. So, all those information about fault mechanism can also be developed based on the ground motion recorded at different different recording stations. So, in today's lecture we will be discussing about seismic waves and how the ground motions which have been recorded by different recording stations can be used to find out the epicenter of an earthquake. So, earthquake as, as uh, we have been impressing upon, the earthquake directly do not cause any kind of damages. It is basically how a particular system whether it is a building, whether it is dam, whether it is a bridge abutment or any other infrastructure. So, how this particular infrastructure is going to respond to particular earthquake or earthquake induced vibration will define the fate whether the structure will undergo partial damage, whether the structure will undergo total collapse or there will not be any damage at all. Simply the system will go back and forth motion and then come back to its original position once the wave passes. So, it is basically the response of a particular structure or a particular system to earthquake loading. If it is able to withstand, it will retain. If it is partially undergoing damage, that means partially it was able to withstand, partially there was some places where, where uh, the in situ strength has exceeded. So, certainly in those cases there might be some development of cracks, shear cracks and, and many more signs of damages. If it does not able to, if, if it is unable to uh, uh, withstand the earthquake loading condition, certainly in such cases it will undergo complete collapse. It can be bridge, it can be abutment, it can be turbine, it can be tunnels and depending upon the structure once uh, the, the one we are dealing with. So, it is basically the response of the structure to earthquake induced loading. So, it is same thing we have mentioned over here also, it is the response of the building, response to various kind of structures or buildings to seismic waves, waves or in general we call it as disturbance which are actual indication or representation of seismic wave generated from the source to the site. If I am standing over here and some earthquake happens, wave will propagate. If I am uh, depending upon where the earthquake has happened and where I am located, maybe with some delay, but certainly wave will propagate through the ground where I am standing. This disturbance will be create carry forward by means of seismic waves. So, whenever waves are passing, I will I will be able to feel some kind of disturbance. If I put a sensor over there, this disturbance will be calibrated in terms of maybe displacement values, how these are changing with respect to time, velocity values with respect to time, how it is varying or acceleration values with respect to time, how these are changing. Earlier, most of the time the ground motion records were used to be recorded in terms of rotating drum followed by some pencil which is actually sensing the vibration and marking it on a calibrated sheet. Later on, we are also using different kinds of piezoelectric sensors. So, that will sense the vibration and convert it in terms of some values of volts and depending upon the calibration unit, we can convert it and find out 
suitable value of ground vibration. So, it is basically the response of the building to seismic loading which will define whether the building will undergo partial damage or complete collapse and subsequently induced effects. Induced effects means the effects which were actually not there, but now because there is vibration involved and this vibration is going to induce additional loading to your structure. Classical example for induced loading is liquefaction. liquefaction. So, I am interested to find out like during a particular earthquake, so what happened during liquefaction? Initially, there was a ground which was quite leveled and the ground was also offering significant bearing capacity, but as the same ground was subjected to earthquake loading condition there will be increase in pore water pressure or there will be development of excess pore pressure which will actually push the soil particles away from each other. Now, entire process whether th that the soil particles are being moved or pushed away from each other is primarily happening because of interaction of seismic waves with respect to the medium or soil particles. So, when such things happen there will be loss of shear strength of the material. The material in which liquefaction phenomena is triggered it will almost transfer from a very uh, stable ground to almost like a liquid consistency ground. So, whatever ground was there if you have used it as a parking area parked your vehicle before an earthquake it was uh, well balanced your, your car was parked in a good manner and then during earthquake the, the, the entire ground undergone liquefaction and then subsequently it will undergo sinking or there will be too much of settlement in the building. So, this is called as induced effect, this is not directly the effect caused by the earthquake, but certainly how the earthquake generated waves have interacted with the medium. So, this is induced effect, it is basically induced by the earthquake, but happening in the medium because medium was not able to withstand the earthquake loading condition. So, the high amount of energy during an earthquake is released in the form of seismic waves or shock waves similar to development of ripples in water. So, as you throw a stone in water then you will see there will be development of ripples. At the same time if you if you are having a leaf in water at certain distance away from where you drop a pebble, you will see there will be development of ripples and when these ripples reach to that leaf you will see initially the leaf was more or less in stable condition be, uh, avoiding the minimal disturbance which was happening before the dropping of the leaf. Suddenly when these ripples which are generated at the place of dropping the stone reaches to the leaf you will see significant upside down movement or at times other time uh, it may also undergo some kind of rotation also. So, this kind of movement which are happening may be because of combined effect it is very much similar to seismic wave passing through a particular medium or ripples created by dropping a pebbles in water. So, kinds of seismic waves now whenever we discuss about seismic waves primarily these are classified into two categories one is what the, the seismic wave which are generated at the source or the epicenter or the focus and when this uh, body waves which are primarily generated deeper at the focus when these interact with surficial or near surface medium of the earth how the seismic waves are interacting and then subsequently that will lead to the development of surface waves. So, as I mentioned you are having two types of wave one is P wave that is called as primary wave or compression wave primarily because these are the first wave which are reaching to a recording station because these are the waves which are fastest in terms of seismic waves all, all seismic waves which we will be discussing over here. So, these are the waves which travel faster and uh, uh, so this, this that is why it is also called as primary wave. So, if you are having a recording station these are the waves which are going to reach to a recording station at first. After that there will be secondary waves. So, you, your recording station is over there you waited for some time some primary waves some disturbance was there and then again you will see that amplitude of the vibration reduces and suddenly sir, there is a jump in the increase in the amplitude of the vibration clearly indicating another type of wave has just reached your recording station indicated by some vibration. So, if this is your recording station 
having ground motion. So, you will see initially there was some disturbance, small disturbance and suddenly reached to the peak, then there was some reduction in the disturbance and again you will see some in some peak over there. So, do not take right now the amplitude in little sense of primary and secondary wave. What I am trying to show over here, firstly there will be P wave arrival followed by S wave arrival. So, these two things when we will be able to differentiate even from the ground motion record provided the ground motion record is also at sufficient distance from the source that arrival of primary wave and secondary wave can be easily distinguished. If recording station is very close, then the difference between P and S wave arrival time will be so small that distinguishing between primary wave and secondary wave will be almost impossible. Uh, at least by naked eye, you can process it, you can find out um, other parameter which will help you in identifying where the primary wave is ending and subsequently that will help you in identifying where is the uh, incoming secondary wave is starting. So, first one is called as primary wave because it is coming first at the recording station, second one is called as shear wave which is the second wave uh, uh, reaching at a recording station. These are also called as shear wave because whenever the, they are passing through a particular medium, they are also inducing shearing in a particular medium. Both these waves whether we are talking about primary wave or secondary wave are the classes of body waves. As I mentioned some time back, their body waves are the waves which are generated at the source and start propagating through the proper medium, whether it is a propagation medium or the crystal medium and even at shallower depth and these get interacted with near surface layer of the earth or near surface soil medium resulted in the formation of surface waves as the name says surface wave means the waves which are you can find out dominating more close to the near the surface. So, these are called as love waves and Rayleigh waves. These are two kinds of wave which are more prominent near the surface. Primary wave and secondary wave are the wave which are actually generated at the source and are propagating. When these are propagating and interacting with near surface layers, then we will have love wave and Rayleigh wave coming into picture. So, as I mentioned P and S wave these are called as body waves and these waves can travel through the earth's interior because they are generating at the source and can be recording even at distance recording station. So, some recording station which are even located at larger epicentral distance you can have clear signature of primary and second uh, uh, primary and secondary wave because these are body waves. In addition you have love wave and rally wave as the name suggests these two are called as surface waves because these are coming into picture coming into existence when body waves are interacting with surface or near surface material. So, these are called as surface wave which can only surface uh, travel through the near surface medium or through crystal medium. Now, primary wave if you look into the detail of primary wave these are also called as compressional wave as I mentioned these are also called as primary wave because reaching first also called as longitudinal wave because whenever these waves are propagating through a particular medium there will be particle motion in the direction of wave propagation. So, if the wave is propagating in this particular direction there will be particle motion in the direction of wave propagation. Whatever particles means particle which are there in the medium propagation medium if wave is passing like this then there will be there will be particle which are also going to and from motion in the direction of wave propagation. So, we have primary wave which is called a longitudinal wave which because it is it is inducing uh, vibration in longitudinal direction at the same time you are having primary wave also to be called by for P wave because these are the waves which are reaching first at a recording station and then these are also called as compressional wave because as I mentioned particle motion is along the direction of wave propagation these are called as longitudinal wave these are called as primary wave because reaching for first at the recording station also called as compressional wave because whenever these waves are passing through a particular medium it actually induce compression and rarefaction in the propagation medium. So, identical to sound waves passing through a liquid or gas. 
So, as sound wave passes through a liquid or gas, there will be compression and rarefaction in the medium. Same is happening with respect to primary wave. Now, in addition, so transmit the seismic energy which was generated at the source by means of compression and rarefaction triggering in the material through which the waves are passing. Now, compression and rarefaction means there will be backward and forward movement of the particles, medium propagation particles. Whatever is the propagation medium through which primary wave is passing, always the movement of medium particles will be happening in backward and forward direction. Now, here we can make out based on the speed, you can see over here primary wave, it can travel at a speed of 5 to 8 kilometer in just 1 second. So, 5 to 8 kilometer even in 1 second a wave passes or travels. Now, we can understand if there is some earthquake happening maybe 100 kilometer, 200 kilometer away from where I am currently sitting, how much time it will take for us seismic wave primarily the primary wave, how much time it will take even if you are located 500 kilometer away from your epicenter, it will just take 100 seconds, it will take hardly 3 minutes of uh, less than that to reach to your recording station. Less than even 2 minutes, it will take to reach your uh, recording station or if you even if you are sitting over here, it will take uh, significantly lesser time. So, we are talking about 1 minute, 2 second, 1 minute, 2 minute, 3 minute like that to feel or to record a, uh, an earthquake which has happened 500 kilometer radial distance. That too I am talking about 5 kilometer per second. We are talking about some other earthquake which is I mean uh, the wave which are traveling in a uh, medium having primary velocity of 8 kilometer per second. Still we can see even it will not take complete 2, uh, two minutes it will take lesser than 2 minutes to reach primary wave generated at 500 kilometer distant earthquake to reach your recording station. So, this is the fastest wave which are uh, fastest seismic wave passing through a particular medium and this is the wave velocity uh, in earth's crust. It is over 8 kilometer per second in mantle and 1.5 kilometer per second in water and 0.3 kilometer per second in air. So, even these waves can travel through water and air. Now, the smaller in the amplitude compared to other types of waves. So, that is what I showed in the previous slide also when I was showing the ground motion signature do not take amplitude into account. The, the whole sense there was to indicate that whenever some vibration is there or some waves are reaching to a recording station, first you will see some minimum disturbance followed by some peak amplitude of the peak might be lower for primary wave as mentioned over here, but there will be some increase in the peak. Again, it will come back to minimal position and then after that once shear wave will reach to a recording station, there will be again increase in your signature of ground motion. So, these are um, the amplitude of these waves are comparatively low with respect to other types of waves. Particle motions, wave is passing in, the di in this particular direction. So, even the particle motion will be happening in the same direction. If you are able to see my hand, so this consider this is the particle, when wave is passing along my hand, even the particle motion is happening in the direction of my hand movement. So, no deformation, once the wave leaves a particular medium, there will not be any kind of deformation or even volume change. So, whatever volume was there before the wave entered to a particular medium, it remains the same once the wave leaves a particular medium. So, there will not be any volume change in the medium, there will not be any deformation in the medium itself. So, this can pass through liquid as well as through solids. Now, here is one animation you can see over here, there is particle motion consider even one particular element over here and then you see once this particular pa uh, wave is passing through a particular medium, there is to and fro motion backward forward mo movement and you can see the particle initially undergone compression, rarefaction and then come back to its original position. So, this is in inducing compression and rarefaction in the medium through which the wave is passing. S wave, now some portion of this wave information I will also discuss in later section when we will be discussing about one dimensional equation of motions for primary wave and secondary wave and then this will be used when we will be discussing about ground response analysis in later lectures. So, shear waves as I mentioned these are the waves which are reaching second at the recording station. 
that is why these are called as secondary waves. These are also called as transverse waves because whenever wave is passing through a particular medium, if this is the direction in which the wave is passing, there will be oscillation in the particle in transverse direction. This is the direction of wave propagation. Particles are undergoing movement in transverse direction, which can be upward downward movement or it can be in the direction perpendicular to your screen. So, this direction if I see in plan, the particle can undergo motion in direction perpendicular to your wave propagation and also in horizontal direction. So, those two will be indicated by the movement of particles triggered by propagation of shear wave. Now, thirdly it is also called as shear waves as the particle is uh, as the wave is moving the particle is undergoing movement in vertical direction. So, consider particles are there in the direction perpendicular to the wave propagation and the nature of particle movement is like this which is, is an example of pure shearing happening in vertical direction same thing even in horizontal direction also there is movement of the particle happening in perpendicular to the direction of wave movement. So, it is inducing shearing in horizontal direction, the other one was inducing shearing in vertical direction. So, cause shear deformation as passed through a particular medium, when primary wave was passing it was triggering compression and rarefaction, when shear wave is passing it is triggering shearing in a particular medium that too in two perpendicular directions with respect to the direction of wave propagation. These are also called as secondary wave because these are the second waves reaching a recording station. So, when primary wave is done then there will be sudden increase in the signature or amplitude of vibration indicating the arrival of secondary wave or shear wave or transverse wave at your recording station. But usually these are slower than primary waves. Material again very much similar to primary wave, once shear wave leaves a particular medium, there will not be any deformation, there will not be any volume change, the material will come back to its original position. So, this can travel through solids, but not from liquid, because liquid in general do not offer resistance to shearing. So, there will not be any propagation of shear wave through liquid and same is applicable for gas. So, there will not be any propagation of shear wave through liquid or through gas, whatever shearing is happening, it will be only happening in terms of if the propagation medium is solid. So, now here we can see the typical velocity of propagation is 3 to 4 kilometer per second. In previous case, in primary wave it was 5 to 8 kilometer per second in earth crust, here it is 3 to 4 kilometer per second. So, even after having 3 to uh, uh, close to 2 minutes of arrival time of primary wave, there will be shear wave which are yet to receive at a recording station, because the wave propagation velocity here for shear wave is slightly lower than primary wave velocity. So, this is 3 to 4 kilometer per second in earth crust, 4.5 kilometer per second in mantle. Particle oscillation happens in perpendicular direction with respect to wave propagation. As I mentioned, if the particle is moving in this particular direction, uh, the wave is moving in this particular direction, the particle motion will be happening perpendicular to your board or again along the board in vertical direction. Now, depending upon which type of movement is triggered by prime, uh, the shear wave, you can still call it as SH wave or SV wave. So, direction in which if the particle is moving in upward and downward direction because of wave propagating in horizontal direction, you call it as S V particle or S V motion, shearing happening in vertical direction. Same way with respect to left and right movement with respect to direction of wave propagation that will be called as S H movement or shearing happening in horizontal direction because of wave propagation. So, this is the nature in which the shearing will happen. Consider there is a shear wave incident on a particular medium, this is elementary rod and you are seeing in side elevation. Now, as the wave moves, so first figure shows elevation of the shearing which is happening in vertical direction. You can see over here, take any particular cross section, you can see over here because of movement of the particle or movement of wave, 
in the direction which is indicated by an arrow over here, you can see the shearing happening in vertical direction. This is the this is the way the shearing is happening. Even here also you can see there is shearing happening in this particular direction. So, this is you can call it as corresponding to S V waves, vertical plane in which the shearing is happening because of secondary wave propagation. So, this is because of particle motion in vertical direction. Same way here also we can see the again the particle motion is happening in horizontal direction. So, you can see over here shearing is happening in this particular direction. Consider this particular plane or this particular plane shearing is happening in horizontal direction and this is triggering particle motion in horizontal direction. So, shear wave is passing through a medium and triggering possibly two times of particle motion one is in horizontal direction one is in vertical direction. Now, later on we will also see now here one thing which later on we will use is there is one particle or one cross section is there which is undergoing shearing in horizontal as well as in vertical direction simultaneously. As a result the propagation of shear wave through a particular medium is also approximated with respect to application of torque. So, when you are talking about torque that means it is happening in horizontal as well as in vertical direction some kind of shearing happening in both the both the planes which is indication of shear wave passing through a particular medium. Now, here also we can see so it is like particle remains same, but movement is happening in horizontal as well as vertical direction simultaneously. Now, as I mentioned that during a particular earthquake at the source or at the focus seismic waves primarily the body waves will be generated and depending upon their inherent properties depending upon what kind of movement they are generating and the medium what sort of resistance medium is offering we can see over here that the wave is not able to propagate through certain medium certain waves are able to propagate through all the mediums. So, consider over here this was the focus of the earthquake through which P wave and S waves are generated. Now, as we see the characteristics of the medium in terms of its viscosity in terms of its consistency physical properties it is changing as you move from crystal medium to mental to core. So, if you start from core crust and there is propagation of primary wave within the crust. So, this is you can say this is the recording station which is actually sensing the vibrations in the ground. Primary wave started from your source reached to your recording station. So, between the source and the site it is more or less traveling in medium of same physical properties if you are uh, if you do not take medium heterogeneity at this moment into account it is propagating more or less in the same medium. So, you will have primary wave and secondary wave both. Now, consider another example we have also discussed then in outer core the material is in molten state that means the physical property of the material with respect to crust and mental has changed taking into account that shear wave cannot pass through liquid or molten state whatever incident shear waves are there that will not be able to propagate through this particular medium. So, whatever shear wave or incident over here the black one you can see over here from source shear wave reached over here same way on this particular part also shear wave has reached, but after this in this particular entire range shear wave is not able to propagate because whatever incident wave is there it should reach to molten outer core and further it cannot propagate because these are characteristics of shear wave it will not be able to propagate further. So, this entire region which is located at 103 degree azimuth on both the sides with respect to your focus with respect to your focus all the recording stations which are located at 103 degree azimuth on either side of the globe will not be able to detect any kind of shear wave generated from the source. It does not mean that the earthquake did not generate any shear wave rather it is the limitation of your location of recording station with respect to epicenter which made the condition such that there will not be any shear wave reach into your recording station located between 103 degree on either side of uh, uh, the globe with respect to focus. Same thing if we talk about primary wave 
primary we started from the source, but once it reaches to significant change in physical properties that means, between the mental and the outer core because of change in properties what we are seeing it is deflecting from its original path and again second deflection is happening over here when it is again reaching to the interface of outer core and mental. Because of this deflection the wave otherwise would have reached to this particular side, but it is not able to because of change in the physical properties of the medium. So, because of this deflection again you see over here in this particular red zone. Though there was primary wave generated at the source, but it will not be able to get detected by recording station located between 103 degree to 143 degree azimuth on one side and same way 103 degree to 143 degree on the other side of your recording station. So, this azimuth will keep on changing if, if you shift your recording station uh, uh, not recording station the focus if the focus of the earthquake is shifted from here to here then corresponding to the revised focus or the focus of an earthquake which has happened very recently 103 degree on two sides of your um, earth and 103 degree to 143 degree again on both the sides. This will be the range of azimuth in which you will not have secondary wave, you will not have primary wave respectively. Since these waves are not there, the zones are also called as P wave zone. So, this is called as P wave shadow zone, this is called as S wave shadow zone. So, there is an earthquake which though produce primary and secondary wave, but considering the physical properties change across the depth of the earth, certain wave will be detected at some recording station, but not be detected at other recording station and subsequently that will be applicable to all the recording station across the globe with respect to the focus of the earthquake targeting. Now, surface wave as I mentioned these move along the earth surface very near to the earth surface results from the interaction of body waves with the surface and other surficial layers of the earth. What are la whatever layers are available near the surface when body waves are interacting with those layers then surface waves come into picture. The amplitude of surface wave decreases drastically or exponentially with respect to the depth. So, whatever amplitude you are seeing at the surface significant drop in the amplitude as you go deeper. More prominent like larger distances usually uh, greater than 1.5 to 2 times the earth uh, crystal thickness you may see significant uh, amplitude in the surface waves. A distance twice the thickness of earth, uh, earth crust surface wave may cause more damages with respect to body waves. So, these arrive after primary and S waves, primary and secondary wave reach a recording station, then it will be followed by surface waves. Deep focus earthquake generally do not produce surface waves. These are further classified into Rayleigh wave and Love waves. Now, as I mentioned, uh, as we can see over here, the Rayleigh wave, which was understood by Lord Rayleigh in 1855, and so after that, these are called as Rayleigh wave also known as lamb waves, whenever these waves are passing through a particular motion, movement, uh, whenever these waves are passing through a particular medium, there will be elliptical motion in the particles in longitudinal direction as well as in transverse direction. So, if the wave is passing like this, there will be movement in the particles in longitudinal as well as transverse direction resembling an elliptical motion. The amplitude decreases exponentially with respect to distance as well as with respect to depth. These are produced, Rayleigh waves are generally produced by the interaction of uh, SV wave or the vertical component of shear wave with and primary wave with respect to the near surface medium. Now, here we can see over here, this is the direction in which the wave, the Rayleigh wave is propagating and as a result of which you can see over here there is movement in the particle representing an elliptical motion or rolling which is happening in the direction of I mean if wave is propagating like this then you can see this kind of rolling or elliptical motion both in longitudinal direction and also in transverse direction with respect to wave propagation. At the same time we can also see that the amplitude of these elliptical motions also significantly reducing as we are going deeper in the 
with respect to the ground surface. So, typical speed at which the Rayleigh wave can propagate, it also depends upon the medium involved. So, 50 to 300 meter per second, further we can go for denser medium and then it can also increase to the speed of uh, sound that is approximately 3 kilometer per second. Other sources of Rayleigh wave are basically ocean waves, movement of railway trains, vehicle movement, sledge hammer impact. So, these are also additional sources based on which the vibration which will be generated will be dominated by Rayleigh wave content. So, this is called most shaking and damage because of its rolling effect. The intensity of shaking by Rayleigh wave during an earthquake event is a function of the size, focal depth, epicentral distance and focal mechanism. So, carries maximum energy released during a particular earthquake. Particle motion will be similar to throwing a stone in pond. So, you will see again some ripples, some elliptical motion in water which will show some kind of ripple movement slightly shorter, slower than S wave depending upon the elastic properties of the medium. The depth of material displacement is equals to the wavelength. So, that material which is involved will be equals to the wavelength of the Rayleigh wave which is coming into picture and that is how one can focus more on what is the depth which one can call it as near surface medium or surficial layers for the development and uh, quantification of Rayleigh wave properties. Next comes is the Love waves. It was again named after Augustus Edward Hugh Love, who discovered these kinds of wave in 1911 and as a result of which these were called as Love waves, also known as Q waves, which are primarily responsible for movement in lateral direction. So, these are generated primarily because of the interaction of horizontal component of shear waves with respect to surficial layers of the earth. There is no vertical movement. So, all the movement which are happening because of love wave passing through a particular medium is primarily happening in, in uh, horizontal direction or in lateral direction. There is no vertical movement. Again, you can see over here that when love wave is passing through a particular medium, the movement is happening in lateral direction. Secondly, we can also see over here that the particle the amplitude of motion significantly reduces as you move from ground surface to deeper layers. So, the amplitude of the motion is reducing, these are always cause lateral movement, there is no component which is triggering movement in vertical direction. Now, arrival of love wave happens after primary and secondary wave, but it happens before Rayleigh wave. So, if there is a recording station and we are interested to find out which wave will come first, then there will be primary wave which will be coming first followed by secondary wave followed by love wave and then Rayleigh wave. This is uh, generally the, 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 uh, the nature in which the different kinds of wave will reach to a recording station. Again in addition to the earthquake source, if any other source of vibrations are there, then in your ground motion record you may also experience some kind of additional noises. If along the propagation path between your focus and your recording station, medium heterogeneities are also available, these will also act as additional source of reflection or refracted waves, which will again reach to your recording station. Depending upon the position of these sources with respect to your recording station and your focus, some of these refracted and reflected component may reach prior to your direct wave this will again add more complications to your ground motion record. Again, once it is reaching to a recording station, because it is not that the record the wave uh, starting from the focus is trying to reach to your recording station. So, wave is propagating in the three dimensional space and then depending upon the response of your ground, some component of the wave are reaching to your recording station. Now, this some component may be reaching directly, some will be undergoing reflection and refraction through a propagation medium. Thirdly, some of the wave which have actually surpassed your recording station and moving further will also have some kind of back scattered waves. So, that will also cause additional vibrations or at times delay or uh, increase in the amplitude of uh, the duration of vibration. 
So, amplitude of the motion in case of love wave also decreases rapidly with respect to the depth. It attenuates at a rate of 1 by r, where r is the epicentral distance. So, 1 by square root r is the rate at which the amplitude of the wave will attenuate, will reduce as you are moving away from your point of origin. Larger earthquakes generally generate love waves, which can travel the earth several times without any kind of dissipation. Travels at a rate of 2 to 4 kilometer per second in earth's surface, depending upon the frequency content of propagating waves. Now, finding uh, an epicenter of an earthquake, see we are interested to know about the waves, because these are finally the waves which are actually generated from the focus reaching to different different whether you call it as recording station, you call it as building, you call it as soil deposit, bridge abutment, tunnels. So, these are the waves which are generated from the source of the earthquake or the focus and then propagating in all the direction. In order to understand the characteristics of the waves, there will be recording station called as seismograph, which will be installed at different different locations. The guidelines for selecting can be covered in other courses, I am not covering over here. So, depending upon the suitability where one can install a recording station, we can go and locate a recording station, which will actually sense the characteristics of vibration during a particular earthquake. So, if there has been an earthquake as a result, wave generated from the source, it reached to a recording station and then move further and this characteristics of vibration, which was available at the location where the recording station is located, that will be detected at the recording station. So, usually it is the disturbance or some sense of uh, ground shaking, how it is changing with respect to time. As I mentioned earlier also, so if you are discussing about some vibration, it is like some rotating drum is there with some pen over there to mark the disturbance. Now, when earth undergoes some kind of vibration, this will also able to mark some vibration. How the vibrations are changing? It should be in vertical direction actually. How the vibrations are changing in with, with respect to time? So, I am standing over here, some earthquake comes, I will go back and forth motion. If I am able to sense that particular motion and calibrate in some fashion of expression, then I will be able to develop a ground motion record. Now, whether I am discussing about displacement change with respect to time or change in velocity values or acceleration values with respect to time, accordingly a particular ground motion record can be called as. So, here in this particular image, we are able to see one typical acceleration time history record. On x axis, you are having time values in second, on y axis, you are having acceleration values. So, you can see whenever an earthquake had come, you had a recording station which is actually sensing the ground vibration. Starting from 0, you can see initially there was no disturbance because there was no arrival of wave. Suddenly, some disturbance, some vibration from wave started coming and then you will see lot of disturbances are there, which can be also quantified in terms of acceleration values given over here in terms of g. So, it is basically the how the value of acceleration is changing over period of time. So, this you can call it as the duration of loading, which is coming over here as close to 90 second. So, it is like whenever there was an earthquake almost close to 90 second there was vibration happening at your recording station. How much vibration? This has been calibrated over here in terms of acceleration time history record. If one is interested to find out uh, the frequency content of the motion, there are ways which will be discussed in terms of uh, when we will be discussing about ground motion characteristics in later lectures. Now, here the, the purpose of showing uh, uh, this particular earthquake record is there will be some primary waves which are coming or are there in this particular record. There might be some secondary waves also which are there in this particular record. So, wave generated at the focus being detected at, at the recording station can be used these signatures to find out where actually the earthquake has happened, because this is going to give me only the nature of ground vibration at my recording station. I am also interested to know which is the source or where is the source which actually triggered earthquake, which is leading to this kinds of vibration. 
So, one is recording station which is actually recording station which is actually recording the vibration and there is focus which is called as source of earthquake. So, though a vibrations are generated from the source reaching to a recording station, I will be taking the ground motion recording and try to reach to locate the source of the earthquake, where the earthquake has happened. Primarily, we will be interested to locate the epicenter of the earthquake, where actually the, uh, the projection of focus is located on the earth surface. Now, seismic wave arrival sequence as we discussed, there will be primary wave, secondary wave, love wave, Rayleigh waves. So, based on the arrival time of different kinds of wave, we are able to detect the primary wave, we are able to detect secondary wave and also we know what is the wave propagation velocity in those medium. Using these two information, we will be able to locate a particular earthquake's epicenter. So, based on the arrival time of primary waves, secondary waves, we will try to find out the distance between recording station and your epicenter, that is epicenter distance now for the recording station and that can be used from a particular seismograph. As I mentioned, seismograph is the instrument and seismogram is this particular record. So, whenever gram comes in the end, this we are referring to record, seismograph is the instrument. So, from instrument, we are uh, taking the ground motion signature, identify P wave and S wave arrival time and try to find out the distance. How we will do that? So, as we mentioned, we have primary wave, we have secondary wave, we have love wave and rally wave. This is the order in which different wave will reach to a recording station. Now, we see over here time for time for arrival of shear wave. From recording station, we can find out what is the time in which the shear wave is coming. We are interested to find out the distance. We do not know where the earthquake has actually happened, but we have some location of your recording station. We also know what is the wave propagation velocity for shear waves. We know the arrival time of shear wave based on the record. If we are able to distinguish between primary and secondary wave. Remember this for at this particular level, we will be able to only apply this particular record if in a ground motion record, we are able to distinguish between which is the point, which is the moment at which primary wave has come, which is the moment at which secondary wave has come. Identifying the arrival time of primary and secondary wave in general is a uh, complex task which requires much more understanding about uh, how the processing of ground motion uh, can be done, how these can be corrected and treating uh, uh, can be treated. So, processing of ground motion record once it is done, you will be able to distinguish between the arrival of primary wave and secondary wave. At this stage, those have not been separated as far as we complete this particular derivation. So, arrival time of shear wave we can find out from here T suffix S is time of arrival of shear wave from an earthquake which is located at d epicenter distance and the wave is propagating your propagation medium with a propagation velocity of v suffix s. Same way we can also find out the time of arrival of primary wave, though we know primary wave will reach first. So, t suffix p is the time of arrival of primary wave at a recording station, d again is the epicenter distance with respect to your recording station, v suffix p is the primary wave velocity for a particular medium. Now, if we take the difference between the two, that means, T p will be more because uh, T s will be more because secondary wave is coming late. So, if you start from 0, the secondary wave arrival time will be more. If you take that particular uh, uh, difference between the time of arrival of shear wave and primary wave, that is how we can calibrate using the equation which were there in equation 1 and 2. That is how from this particular equation 3, we can determine T which is the epicentral distance, which is the objective to find out over here. We can determine the value of, I mean for known value of V p and V s, we will be able to determine the value of how much should be the primary wave velocity, uh, the distance between your recording station and your epicenter. So, we need not have the actual arrival time of primary wave and secondary wave, rather the difference in the time of arrival of primary and secondary wave if it is there, 
then we will be able to use it over here because this is simply going to give me the distance between T and S wave. So, you need not worry about absolute time even when record is there looking at the record if you are able to find out the difference in the time between primary and S wave, uh, secondary wave with respect to the record itself that will help us in finding out T S minus T P or the difference in the time between primary and secondary wave arrival using this particular equation that is equation number 4. So, we have the value of T s minus P T p, we have the value of V p, we have the value of V s that means, material characterization for a particular medium if it is available. Usually, whenever we are installing a recording station, we will also try to find out for recording station what is the subsurface profiling. So, that can also be used in crystal medium and mental uh, properties more or less one can refer to existing literature to find out this. Okay, so, using this we will be able to determine the value of d. Now, this d is with respect to epicenter the earthquake can be any distance located with a radius of capital D all around your recording station because this is going to only give the epicentral distance. It is not going to tell whether it is you have to move a north, you have to move east, west or south. It is only going to give you a radial distance range within which an earthquake can be located. So, to do that what we will do? We will discuss about first method three circle method. What we will do? Depending upon the coordinates of your recording station, we will locate three points. So, these three points are located based on the latitude and longitude of your recording stations or coordinate of your recording station. Referring to those coordinates and determining the value, we have taken first recording station we have determined the value of capital D 1 that with respect to uh, recording station 1, what is the epicentral distance 1 or what is the radial distance from recording station 1 which can be referred to in order to develop uh, the radial distance or the circle. Similarly, with respect to recording station 2 and recording station 3 also has to be continued. Remember these are the seismograph or recording stations which I am mentioning over here. So, D for all the three recording station you can call it as D 1, D 2 and D 3. So, all three recording stations are there depending upon the formula which was there in equation number uh, 4. D 1 you have the value of T s T p determine the value of D 1 or the radial distance from recording station 1 referring to which you can find out the epicenter of the earthquake same way with respect to D 2 which is another recording station. So, you will have another value of T s minus T p. For D 3 again there will be another value of T s minus T uh, T p. As a result D 1, D 2, D 3 all three will have different values of epicentral distance. Take those epicentral distance and keeping the coordinate or the center of your recording station as the center of the circle. Draw a circle of radius D 1 from point 1. So, this is point 1, this is point 2, this is point 3, which are basically indication of the coordinate of your recording station. So, take 1 mark a circle of radius D 1, take 2 as center mark a circle of radius D 2, 3 as center mark a circle of radius D 3, draw those circles and then we will see for this particular circle this was the radius or range of epicentral distance for D 2 this was the radius and D 3 this was the range of location in which epicenter can be there. Since all these circles are generated corresponding to same earthquake the common area now you see over here this particular point is the common area which I have just drawn this particular point is basically indication of a region which is common location of epicenter as suggested by record from station 1, suggested by record from station 2, suggested by record from station 3. So, all three records are going to suggest what is the common area from all the three circles which are generated using the record from same earthquake at three different recording station. This is called as three circle method. So, more than three also are there then you will be able to more accurately locate the epicenter of the, uh, the epicenter of the earthquake. So, minimum three stations are there many a times it may happen like here it is converging to similar small area many a times it may happen that when we draw three circles 
rather than a small area you will end up in getting a larger area. So, that means, in that particular larger area the epicenter of the earthquake can be located anywhere. In order to further narrow down to a shorter area, a smaller area, we can have maybe 4 circle, 5th circle such that it will every time you draw another circle it actually reduces the common area to a lesser area. So, that is how you can more accurately locate potential locations which are the epicenter of the targeting earthquake. If you do not have any earthquake record more than 3 circle, if you are not able to locate then the common area from all the 3 circles you can say the potential region where the epicenter of the earthquake can be located. So, with this uh, background I will stop here and uh, in next class we will solve one numerical related to this and we will also discuss about one more. Uh, so, in next class we will continue this particular topic, we will solve one more numerical and see how based on one particular earthquake record one we will be able to locate the epicenter of the earthquake. And one we will we will also discuss further about magnitude and intensity values and how one can quantify the magnitude of a particular earthquake. So, thank you and uh, we will continue the numerical related to this topic in lecture number 8. Thank you everyone.